for that on the page of the blog. It doesn't cost you anything. So that's how that works. As for the Batty Fellowship thing, um, there are a few copies of, of this which anyone who's interested is welcome to pick up later uh, up on the table there. Uh, and it just tells you about something that I and some other writers, a historian and a couple of other fiction writers, are going to be doing in the State Library as a public presentation, mainly from me, but with a panel of these others as well, um, in a couple of weeks' time. So pick that up if you're interested. It will tell you something about the world of library research in relation to fiction. Well, uh, time travellers, are you ready to be taken back to the 19th century? Uh, fasten your seatbelts. Um, we're starting with a place that I'm sure is familiar to all of you, at least uh, you've been past it, many of you have been in it, and some of you, bless you, uh, are volunteers there or have a special connection with it. Is there anyone here from the South Perth Historical Society by any chance? One or two? Okay. Because you may well know quite a lot, probably more than me, about some aspects of the Old Mills history. What I'm going to be doing tonight is not giving you a lecture on the, on the history of the Old Mill, because I'm not the world expert on that. Um, I'm going to be telling you how the book that I've recently had published, which is a novel, as Tamara said, a fictional work, is nevertheless based in some ways on the mill, and I'll tell you what I mean by that. First of all, uh, it was the starting point for my conception of what that story might be. It came to me when I was working as a heritage consultant for the city of South Perth some while back uh, on an interpretation plan for the old mill. And uh, in doing that, I discovered some things that set me thinking about a possible work of fiction. I'll tell you more in a minute. But also in the novel itself, in the published book, um, the mill, although this is not a novel about the mill solely and simply, the, the mill figures in this in important ways. In fact, on the very first, facing the very first page of the text, there's a photo of the old mill, and the, the prologue is, is headed Mill Point, January 1882. So it's the starting point for the book. And the story comes back to that uh, towards the end. Has anyone actually read this right through by any chance? Oh, good. Um, <laughs> oh, um, no spoilers then about, uh, about the climax or anything like that in the, in the story. But So the old mill is not the subject of the novel, it's the starting point of the novel, both in the sense that it was the thing that sparked my imagination to get me thinking about what a story might be, and also in the sense that the, the novel actually begins on its first page with the old mill and returns to it later in the story. Well, that's the old mill as we know it, um, thanks to my uh, trusty iPhone um, and some good weather. Uh, so it's a nice sunlit photo and it looks quite bright and shiny, but it hasn't always looked like that. And what I'm going to do to start with is show you a few images from the past so that those of you who don't know about the history of the mill, and of course some of you know a lot, but those of you who don't know can get a sense of what this has been, this place, and some of the ways in which it's been important. These images are sourced from the Batty Library and uh, shown with their permission. So, let's see how we go. Uh, I should tell you first, because some of you may know about this, especially if you're part of the um, historical society or have a special interest, that um, just 10 years ago, the city of South Perth had a wonderful exhibition in Heritage House, um, curated by Christine Sharkey and with others contributing, including those who mentioned up the top, um, June Shenton Turner and Alvin Parsons. They've written essays in this, but it's a, it's a, a catalogue, really, of many, many photographic uh, and painterly images of the mill from earliest times onwards. It's been a perennial popular subject. And not surprisingly, um, because of what you'll see from photographs of the various stages it's been through. And um, that is just one of many paintings. There have been a great number. You won't see many, any of those in this, but you'll see a few 
tighter. Whoops. Now, that was wrong here. <laughs> Try going back and see whether by any chance. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, you can't see that for some reason. Um, I've had a bit of a problem with that image. Um, it keeps dropping out, but I'll tell you what it was. Um, as you can tell from the top, it's, it shows someone, very early photograph, and it's a pity you can't see it because there is someone in the foreground who is just below Mount Eliza uh, on the hillside there, looking out across in our direction. And the middle is there is just a tiny little white speck, barely discernible, in what is otherwise a bit of a wasteland. There's just nothing else there. Because in 1862, of course, South Perth wasn't anywhere near being developed, and there was hardly anything here. But I'm sure the next images will be all right. Um, only uh, a bit later, um, someone by the name of Thomas Henry Johnson Brown, known by the nickname Satan, um, not because he was a bad man, ironically, he was called Satan because he had very black hair and very sallow complexion, and there were a lot of Tom Browns around town, they had to distinguish him from the others. At least that was his story, it wasn't about But um, this, this phase of the old mill is to me the most fascinating of all. And uh, it's, this is taken uh, a little after 1880, but it represents still what it was that Brown decided to do to the mill. So if you can imagine underneath it, you know, take away that, that superstructure, the old mill was a place, of course, for grinding flour. But it ceased to function as a mill for that purpose after only a few years, had a very short life as a functioning mill, grinding flour for the early settlers. Uh, for a lot of reasons, um, uh, it was not easy to get the flour from Guildford, the, uh, the grain from Guildford in particular, in that area, bring it to that particular tip of the, of the little peninsula, uh, grind the flour, uh, get it back on the river. The river was the road in those days, of course, and get it then across to Perth or down to Fremantle, etc. There were too many logistical difficulties and the wind didn't blow reliably anyway at that particular point. So it didn't last as a mill, but Brown had the idea of taking what was by then a derelict place and doing something ambitious with it. And some of you will know what that was. Uh, he wanted to turn it into a stately pleasure dome, into something he called the Alta Gardens which was to be a kind of, we would say, resort hotel, uh, picnic ground. He had grand plans, and these are all set out in newspaper advertisements. He intended there to be archery lawns, cricket grounds. Um, the bit at the top, the viewing platform, was for looking out at regattas on the river, and so on. And this was where people would uh, promenade with uh, a glass of ale or whatever in their hands and um, do whatever you do when you've got a glass of ale in your hand and chat people out and so on. Uh, the, the old cottage uh, dates back uh, to the time of the original mill and he was using that as part of the, um, part of the proposition too, the business proposition. Come and stay for a few days. Hotel. Um, of course, uh, since there weren't any people to speak of around South Perth, even by 1880, uh, he had to get people across from Perth, and that meant things like um, hiring paddle steamers and uh, other craft to bring people across. Well, we won't dwell too much on that for the moment, because I'll say a little more about it later, but <clears throat> before long, of course, uh, since Brown's adventure was sadly short-lived, he would have um, liked history to say that he was ahead of his time. Maybe he was just foolhardy or imprudent in business, but however you want to read it, there's a story there. He was someone who tried to do something grand with a peculiar kind of starting point, an old abandoned mill, and um, uh, he was not triumphant. Uh, so before long, um, the mill starts to get uh, uh, a bit degraded um, and people 
drift in occasionally to have a look at it, but nothing much else happens for a while. But you could still have things like this. Um, there weren't that many picturesque views of Perth by 1905, but there were a few in the middle figured in, uh, in calendars and so on, postcards quite often. Uh, in around this time, and I won't get too precise about the historical particulars, but uh, the mill went through various incarnations, somewhat inglorious one as a chook farm, um, a rather more elevated one as a, um, a meeting place for a circle of artists associated with Lady Margaret Forrest, the mm. Premier's yeah. wife, who was a very fine artist herself. Mm. And uh, of course some of you would know that May Gibbs and May Gibbs' mm. father lived and painted in the vicinity and so on. But uh, there were a lot of things like that. It was also a station for the river police at one stage. Um, and uh, so it served various purposes, usually not for very long. Yeah. <clears throat> and of course, depending on the light and you know, your own particular preconceptions, you could see it even through a camera as either like this, as a gelatin photo um, by Fred Flood, rather lovely looking image, somewhat gothic in its gloominess. Um, here, uh, a couple of old mongrels and uh, <laughs> dog <laughs> kennels, yeah. unless they're beehives, or both. <laughs> but anyway, clearly not such a romantic kind of picture. So, um, people saw the, the old mill in, in different ways. By 1929, it was uh, not in great condition, but it was an obvious place for there to be some ceremonial activity, as some of you would know. <laughs> All this was tested before I left, but there you go. This is a warning to me. All right, so um, uh, just what the last, the previous slide would have shown you, but a lot of you know this, is that in the late 1950s, the, um, with the help of the manufacturing firm Brisbane and Wunderlich, um, it was it became a, a folk museum, uh, and pioneering <coughs> memorabilia from all over the state was donated, uh, and it, so you got you know old rustic things around the mill and in the mill, um, in, in the building, and a lot of people still remember that fondly. Older people. You know, when they were younger, used to go there, and some of them were quite sad that the folk museum didn't survive. But um, by the 1990s, the National Trust um, inherited responsibility for that building and felt it needed to bring the site into line with the current <coughs> heritage guidelines. So the all the paraphernalia, much of which didn't belong in any sense to the old mill historically, it was just associated with it. That was stripped away as it were, and the image that you saw at the beginning uh, was what emerged from that. Uh, and of course now the city of South Perth has particular responsibility for it. Well, that's all background uh, to telling you a little about the book which began through my thinking about the old mill and, and about Salem Brown in particular. Brown was, as some of you know, a very clever but luckless fellow. He had been, uh, he's what we would call a white collar convict. He came from a very respectable background, um, a lot of professional training. In the early days of railway in, uh, in England, he uh, had been a trained architect and engineer. He um, had uh, rubbed shoulders with some of the big names in uh, Victorian uh, rail uh, industry. But then in 1862 came his personal crash when he was convicted of forgery. Uh, he always maintained it was his wife's fault, uh, <laughs> which could have been true. Which could have been uh, and you know, that's the kind of thing, if you're a historian, you keep running up against the who knows kind of, you know, the facts will only take you so far. Mm. And having written a certain amount of, as it were, pure history myself in, in the past, I've got plenty of respect for that discipline of fidelity to fact, 
but I also know that it often doesn't lead you anywhere very satisfying. Mm -hmm. And um, some of you are probably like me, you want to imagine what it would have been like for a certain person in a certain time and place. How would it have felt to be in this situation? Uh, knowing this much, what else can you imagine that might give you the feeling, the, the illusion, but the pleasant illusion of actually being there? And that's what a novel can do, uh, and that's what pure history doesn't try to do. Um, so, in inventing a story, which is partly about Satan Brown, um, and which begins in uh, the 1830s in England, imagining his apprenticeship, uh, locating him in a place where the rail industry was just beginning uh, to expand in Lancashire, and then uh, taking him on through into London, the teeming metropolis, and uh, some of the things that would have been no doubt part of his experience there, up to the point where he gets convicted and transported here. So if you're going to do that kind of thing, then some of those questions on, on the right probably raise themselves. You know, why are you doing this? Uh, a historian might say to me, you know, why don't I stick to the facts? And I've already given a bit of a general answer to that. But uh, I told you a certain amount. The novel didn't really get going in my mind until I came across the story of another person, another white-collar convict by the name of Alfred Litch who um, came here earlier than Satan Brown. He came, Letch came on the second of the convict transport ships in 1850. And he was younger anyway than <coughs> Brown at the time of being transported here. And Letch did very well. He became a, um, quite quickly a prosperous businessman. And I'll show you a bit more about him in a moment. So uh, without going further just yet, Immediately, there, there's a question for a, for a novelist anyway. Why would one person do very well and another person do not so well um, when both of them were talented, both of them were from respectable backgrounds, more or less, and both of them came out here facing much the same kind of um, opportunities and challenges. So that's where the novel got going, a story of two people. But then more got involved as well. Let me show you this. So I mentioned Alfred Lech. Am I in anyone's way? If I, no, if I stand over here a bit. Perhaps you can see, even if you're right over this side, that what's being summarised there is a pretty successful career. Remember, this is someone who comes out as a 27-year-old who's been convicted of theft, a disgrace to his family. He even changes his name, partly to protect his family's good name. Um, and so just as Thomas Brown becomes Satan, Alfred, by his own choice, becomes um, Alfred de Leach, which sounds either a bit more posh or anything. <laughs> so, who knows? Anyway, he does pretty well. And even quite unusually for an ex-convict, um, he becomes eventually a Perth city councillor and gets re-elected mm. more than once. So that's, as you can see, sorry, is that what? The inheritance, tell us, the inheritance, that would have to be an advantage. Uh, that certainly helped. Uh, that was £80 on the death of his father. Um, so yes, that's, that, it came at the right time. It meant that just after getting his ticket of leave, he could actually buy something to style up livery stables on the banks of the swamp. That was his first step. Quite right. But then, as I've mentioned, a more troubled story in the case of our other white collar convict. I've summarised most of that. But one thing you need to know, if you don't already know it, is that the picture which is on the cover of the book is a painting by the real Satan Brown. He was actually, as many architects were, a trained artist. He was very good. And a number of his paintings have been preserved. Uh, this, um, you, you'll find paintings of his in the National Gallery in Canberra. That's where permission to reproduce this came from. It stretches across the, the back cover as well. 
Um, the Art Gallery of WA, uh, the Royal WA Historical Society, the Mitchell Library in Sydney and so on, they have drawings and paintings uh, from Stephen Brown. Most of them commissioned when he first uh, became self-employed, just before he got sent off uh, to beyond the Black Stump, um, uh, down inland from Bunbury to be a sole teacher in a little school. Uh, and at the time when all that was happening, Alfred Letch, who was, who was younger anyway, Letch was in his 40s, by this time um, Brown was in his 50s, and uh, Letch is thriving and Brown is not. So, as I say, that's part of the story. But, uh, the story didn't stop there because the more research I did into those people, uh, <coughs> partly in the Batty Library and partly in published materials, the more I found um, other stories threaded through theirs. In particular, I came across the fascinating fact that someone called Thomas Rowe was sent by the London Metropolitan Police to keep an eye on those hot-blooded Irishmen who were sent out on the very last of the transport ships in 1868 as political prisoners, Fenians, Republicans, and there were some famous names among them, one of which is mentioned underneath, John Warren O'Reilly. <clears throat> well, Thomas Rowe was sent, as I say, by what we would call Scotland Yard to keep an eye on those political um, prisoners. But when we looked at the ship's manifest for that voyage, there was no Thomas Rowe among the warders or the passengers. There was a Thomas Rowe listed among the convicts. <coughs> now, what the real story was, that whether that was a totally different Thomas Rowe, it seems quite possible, and whether this Thomas Rowe was just not listed in order to keep his activity secret, historians can't tell you. But I can tell you that in the novel, I decided <laughs> to make some use of the fact that there was this coincidence or discrepancy, call it what you will. So a fiction writer will often try to get not at the literal truth beyond a certain point, but rather at the possibilities. Because by this stage, it was beginning to seem to me that part of the theme, one of the themes of the novel could be shifty, names and shifty identity because people had to reinvent themselves when they came out here. They'd left behind the world of the Industrial Revolution and come out to a pre-industrial society, essentially. Um, a place that, almost, that seemed almost vacant with a few buildings perched on the sand and there was the opportunity and in some cases the need to become a different person. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, when did you say that Thomas Satan Brown was was uh, was transported? Yes. When was he when was he transported? What, what 1863. Oh, 1863. So the police, you know, as a concept, uh, as as a, a unit that had already been well established. And that's his problem. Yes, but Thomas Rowe became the first detective in Western Australia. Mm -hmm. He came out as a detective or a spy, if you like, yeah. and he became the, the first detective, first person. You know, with that kind of function. I could say a lot more about him, but O'Reilly, of course, uh, many of you would know, uh, became a famous escapee. Uh, he got away, uh, went to the US where he was lionised. He wrote a book uh, about prison, a novel about prison life in Western Australia, our first novel. Um, and uh, then he engineered the escape of half a dozen of his. Irish colleagues, the famous Catal Boris. Well, in historical fact, Thomas Rowe was the poor hapless guy who had to coordinate the police response to the Catal Boris scam. So these stories start to thread together. And O'Reilly, whom Rowe would have been watching closely on the voyage out and spending a bit of time within Fremantle Prison because when Rowe first arrived, they didn't know what, the, the authorities didn't know what to do with him. He was an inconvenience, a spy. Um, so you'll find out if you buy the novel like that. Might have happened. Yeah. Meanwhile, there were some free centers coming up because this is not a story, not a novel just about men. 
Um, and again, this is one of the difficulties. If you are a pure historian, uh, sticking strictly to the discipline of, of verifiable fact, then you'll find that, except with a few partial exceptions, like Georgiana Malloy and Lady Margaret Forrest, and even those that remain somewhat shadowy figures, most of the women are obscured. They are just there in the record as adjuncts to men. Well, I wanted this to be a story about women as well as men, and so Amelia French, who, was, who became the wife of Alfred Ledge, and Alfred Ledge's niece, Mary Ann, known as Polly Ledge, became Thomas Brown's wife. In, in reality. So, here are all these stories. I mean, you have to do a lot of inventing if you're going to write a good novel, but in this case, a lot of <coughs> wonderful crossings over, similarities, differences, coincidences, connections, all came together for them. John Acton Roth, some of you will know that name. Um, uh, you'll find a, one, a brass plaque uh, in, embedded in the pavement of St George's Terrace, along with lots of others, um, which mentions him. Well, he uh, was taken under Alfred Lecture's wing when, uh, when Roth arrived as a genteel background prisoner, another white collar man, and uh, quite young. And uh, for a while, Alfred Lecture was his hero, his brother, he called him in letters home. Didn't last. Um, and there's a bit more of a story. Henry Savingson was one of many Jewish convicts who had the double uh, challenge of trying to get accepted among free settlers and trying to get accepted as a Jew at a time when that was not always going to be easy. Uh, so some of these people come to the story as well. Well, I'm not going to tell you how it all turns <laughs> out. Um, because I'm, I'm sure you would much prefer to find out page by page. Yep. But uh, that, yep. I hope, gives you a little bit of an idea of how someone who has a respect for historical fact and some, dare I say, some skills as a researcher, some experience yep. as a researcher, gets to a point with certain, a certain set of material of saying, there's got to be a way of using invention judiciously to enlarge the scope of this story so that it doesn't stop inconclusively where the facts, the known facts, stop, but it moves on and suggests ways in which uh, this very small world of colonial Perth and Fremantle might have included some connections that some people didn't really want to acknowledge and some they didn't even know about <coughs> between each other. So degrees of separation. Um, so that's about as far as um, I, I think time allows me to go, but forgive me for the commercial note here, but it was mentioned earlier, so I thought you'd want to know. Um, if you want to buy any of these in the shops, you actually have to pay $32.95 for that one, uh, which is, um, these are all historical novels. Um, this one, based on some of my own family history, but wildly invented beyond that, because in fam my family history, there is a, a villain figure, um, possibly a serial murderer, certainly an international con man, uh, <laughs> whom I wanted to make into a sympathetic character. So, um, so th this is a story uh, about the late 19th century uh, and the way in which the expansion of rail and steamship travel opened opportunities to ordinary people, which wouldn't have been available before that, to travel uh, to all sorts of places. So the two main characters here, once they come together in Australia, uh, one of them being a Canadian, the other a New Zealander, getting married in, in Melbourne, how they go off together to a great variety of places. And their itinerary is all factually based, but everything else about their motivation and so on is invented. So that's my first novel. This is the second. Some of you know it because you were talking to me about it earlier. This is actually set more in South Perth than the one I've just um, been talking about because this one is early 20th century. It's set in southern Riverside suburbs, Como, South Perth, Applecross, etc. That untravelled world, which uh, some of you may 
vaguely recollect having come across in a poem by Tennyson when you were in high school. Um, it's from Tennyson's poem, Ulysses. All experience is an arch, where through gleams that untraveled world, etc. So this is about uh, someone who comes as a young engineer from Sydney to Perth to work on the building of the, the wireless station at Applecross. And then goes through the experiences of the Great War and the Great Depression, the build up to the Second War. So it's really, in a sense, not just about him and the people he meets, it's about what happened to Australian society from 1912, when it starts, which is a time of great optimism, the country was still young, the protagonist is still young, but then these traumatic experiences make Australia and these characters sadder and wiser in various ways. That's that one, and you know enough about the the mind's own place, which I've been discussing. So, <coughs> with Christmas in mind, <laughs> and all your friends and relatives, why not just do it in one head? Um, my suggestion is that you can buy any one of those tonight for $20, which is a substantial reduction. Even greater reduction, two for 30. And if you were to want to get three for 40, and if, if, they, if it was the different three, you'd actually be getting more than $80 retail price for 40 and so forth. So tonight only, cash only. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much. <laughs>
used to be in a formal life a professor of literature. So literature is really my focus, and history just comes into it because I don't see how you can read intelligently without reading, you know, the past into the present. So. For more detail, come on to, to your come. presentation. Yeah. On which, what Where there happens to be a flyer over there. Okay. <laughs> 19th of August, 6 pm, in the State Library um, is, is mine. So, not, not far away, actually. Not far away. Lovely. Okay, not far away. Um, anybody else? Do you find, so, do you find that when you've, when you've written this, um, it was really a way of sort of back in your former teaching years, but need to stay overseas and locally? As associate professor, you know, the way Admiral Curtin, as the card says, do you find that really sort of allowed you to strengthen or improve your lecturing of your of your pu pupils when it came to history and, and the like? Like having some, I guess, writing and creative pieces that improve your 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 narration or your, your maybe uh, your the, the um, without getting too uh, detailed about my fairly ordinary bi autobiography. One thing, as far as the writing is concerned, that may be of interest is that I've only turned to writing novels in the last few years when I've essentially finished my teaching role. Um, in earlier days, when I was doing much more teaching, I was a poet. Um, people don't read much poetry anymore. Um, in fact, they're starting to stop reading novels too, which is a bit of a worry. I'm mm -hmm. going to have to write yeah. film scripts next. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be when I'm in the retirement home, I think. Um, no, so to come back to your question, I think I always found it helped my teaching to be a practitioner. I think that's really the nub of your question. And um, these days, uh, I mean, I still have a connection with UWA and with Curtin, but I don't get to talk to students much, ex except when students turn up in gatherings like this and uh, want to hear what I've got to say. So. I've certainly improved my own understanding, I think, of literary and historical problems through you know, having to struggle to cover the blank page with something mm -hmm. that people would want to read. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I certainly remember my days in high school and the uh, subjects of, of um, human mm -hmm. biology um, was very brought to life by reading novels. I thought you were going to say that you put it into practice. <laughs> <laughs> And so to bring that to life through a novel can, in, uh, I think, can ignite an interest and a, and a passion for um, the reality of the situation because they're, they're able to put themselves in that experience oh, and suddenly yeah. it opens doors and history suddenly becomes interesting and worthwhile. And, and I know that um, anybody who's interested in history is, is, is interested in history for many reasons, but not least of which is if we don't learn from the past, of course we're destined to repeat the same mistakes, mm -hmm. blah, 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 you know, as we all know. So I, I think historical novels have a, a wonderful place to fill in that. Well, I, I would hope so, because space. certainly for me, and I think for most people who write his serious historical fiction, as it were, um, it's not a matter of being an antiquarian who just wants to live in the past, although I think my wife would probably say I really shouldn't into the 19th century. <laughs> but it's more that one wants to try to have things from the past resonate with things in the present. Mm -hmm. And I felt that very much with the previous novel. Um, wireless technology in its very first phase, a century ago, um, could not have foreseen our dependence these days on Wi-Fi and, and uh, radio astronomy and so on. And yet, it is, you know, being an earlier phase, it encounters many of the same challenges and many of the same technological disappointments. So very often, I think, when you are writing about the past imaginatively, you are seeing connections or reverberations with the present. So I hope that's true anyway with what I do. The last question that I'd like to ask, if has got you. Yes, I was I enjoyed the talk very much. 
Ian, one thing I always lamented was that when I was doing English, I was a scientist, um, the maths teacher was able to demonstrate their skills, mm. and the science teacher was able to demonstrate their skills. And none of my English teachers ever showed us some of their writing, mm -hmm. which I think was very lamentable, because mm. even a paragraph. But I can remember when we worked together, uh, I would come to your office, and you're actually writing by hand, um, standing up, I think. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, and I thought to myself, well, this is something that I missed out on as a, as a student. Mm. Um, so one question I was going to say, do you still write by hand or do you use a computer these days? <laughs> uh, that was one question. My second question uh, is, you've named these people in the, uh, in the novel. Mm. They're actually real people. Yes. Um, how do you uh, rationalise uh, them being their names and being associated with fiction mm. on the sidelines. Yes, so that, that's that second question is really a more, a, a more focused, more precise uh, challenge. Uh, the, the question that was asked earlier about history and fiction and what some of the responsibilities are. And again, I have to cop out a bit by saying mm. I'd have to give you a very long answer to try to do justice to myself and the question tonight. But I will be talking about exactly that sort of thing in this, on the 19th of August. <laughs> um, uh, because um, I, I think it does take a little bit of, of you know, teasing out of the, the, the difficulties. Yes, I, I did take a risk, I suppose you could say, in deciding to preserve the names of those people. You might ask why, since some of it is fictionalised. And it's partly that um, I thought if I just gave them, you know, totally invented names, Joe Bloggs and so on, instead of Satan Brown, people wouldn't in the same way be attracted as I hope they will be to do their own searching about Satan Brown or Alfred Lynch or Polly or Amiga or whatever. I mean, I don't want to be the, the, the kind of controller of the stories about these people. They have their own life in reality, though, as I said, unless people are shrewder researchers than I am or more assiduous, they won't get beyond a certain point because the, the records aren't there. So so that's part of it. I wanted to I wanted to bring these people to life in a sense, um, to respect their their actuality as people, as historical figures. And I couldn't really do that, I couldn't see a way for me to do it without inventing more to give more flesh and blood and detail to the bare bones of the historical facts. Mm -hmm. But yes, I'm sure that there will be people, as I said before, maybe including some of their descendants who will say, yeah. Yeah. that was a bit pertinent. Yeah. Uh, on your, your first question, yes, I, I, I do still do a bit of longhand, but yeah. computers these days um, are so much quicker for taking copies and modifying, revising, so that mm -hmm. is well. Yeah. Well, thank you, because my question was going yeah. to be about your journey of writing, how you write. So um, we're now at a time when I need to wind things up and anybody who has any further questions I invite you to come and ask Ian um, while he does some signing. Um, the books are uh, obviously for sale and as I said if you wouldn't mind writing your name or to anybody that you want to dedicate it to. And um, Ian will be here to sign your books and talk. Please join me once more in saying thank you very much.